as Christians, we are called to be grateful in all situations, even the fine details of our lives. We seek to understand that they are under the control of a good and sovereign God, our Heavenly Father. We know this, and we constantly remind ourselves, don't we, of this foundational truth. And so we strive to be patient people. Travel delays, however, can test the patience of the best of us. Checking the departure time on the screen, checking the app, seeing that delay get bigger and bigger can be infuriating. But in our more sane moments, we can find the grace to say it's all in God's hands. And so, that's the best. Patience is more than a virtue. It is a fruit of the Spirit. And with his help, we can even thank God for travel delays. Fascinatingly, the threat of a travel delay motivated the writing of a portion of Holy Scripture. Paul explains in his first letter to his good friend and mentee, Timothy. He says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things in case I'm delayed. See the end of chapter 3. Now, unlike the letters and emails we often write, the epistles of the New Testament tend to reveal their main point midway through. 1 Timothy is no different. At the end of chapter 3 of this six-chapter book, as we have it in our Bibles, is where we find the key that lets us into Paul's intention for the whole letter. Please look with me at chapter 3, verse 14. We'll just read a few verses here. Paul writes, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. Now, even at first glance, this section of the letter looks special on the page, doesn't it? It's clearly some sort of formula, a confession, a poem, a creed. The word creed is from credo, which simply means, I believe. So this succinct statement of faith that Paul includes in his letter is a neat summary of the gospel, of God's plan of salvation. From these key verses, we learn that the intent of the author is that the church may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. <coughs> so we're concerned here about behavior, knowledge affecting behavior, and that's important. Knowledge affecting behavior in the context of family relationships within a household. Keep this in mind as we progress. Now, a couple of weeks ago, the oldest uh, class of the Sunday school, the three boys, received a copy of the closed canon of the 66 books of God's glorious word, a beautifully typeset, bound edition of the English Standard Version of the Bible. But when we study the letters of the New Testament, it's helpful to appreciate that the original recipients didn't have any such book on their bookshelves. Even if they could have, the vast majority of them wouldn't be able to read it because they would have been illiterate. They didn't even have bookshelves. So the New Testament as such was still being written at the time. Picturing this original context... Consider the value of short, dense, easily memorable pieces of theology. Paul gifts to the church via Timothy a number of these precious little treasures. 
a wonderful teaching tool for this elder as he labored to educate his congregation about God's Messiah, Jesus the Christ. You can just imagine Timothy preaching this in Ephesus. He was manifest in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Christianity, then, is a religion founded upon facts, not feelings or fairy tales. Ours is a historic faith. The facts about Jesus are the mystery of godliness, which is really the secret of true religion. A secret being revealed by the wo worldwide proclamation of Jesus Christ. Christ himself, the word, is who we deliver when we preach and teach, and him crucified. Paul is very intentional about summarizing grand theological truths so that they can be understood by the average man. Believed, rehearsed, and then bear fruit in the lives of God's children. Of course, statements like this that we have here, which Paul scatters through his writings, remain a real treasure store for us today. Of course, ultimately, these credos are a gift from the Holy Spirit himself. So God willing, over five midweek meetings, we'll look at the five so-called faithful sayings contained in the pastoral epistles. We'll study one of these statements of faith per session. As I'm sure you know, the three New Testament books often called the pastoral epistles are 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. And these statements of belief that we're talking about are easy to find in those books because they are conveniently tagged with the phrase, the saying is trustworthy, as most modern translations have it. Or, this is a faithful saying, as older translations put it. Who knew that tagging important messages so they could be easily searchable was not an innovation of Silicon Valley. You can discover the first three in 1 Timothy, chapters 1, 3, and 4. The fourth saying is in the second letter to Timothy, chapter 2. And you'll spot the fifth and final trustworthy saying in Titus, chapter 3. So already, I hope we're beginning to see why we should pay special attention to these verses. First, simply because that's what Paul does. The refrain, the saying is trustworthy, functions like a linguistic highlighter. More generally, our most fundamental reason for Bible study is summed up in that famous passage about God's word. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So studying any portion of scripture can be profitable for a Christian, a disciple of Christ. What's more, rather than Rather conveniently, for our purposes, this passage provides part of the direct context for our studies because it's found in Paul's writings to Timothy. Paul, as we know, is an expert teacher, helping the church in every generation to train in the school of Christ. But why now? Why are we spending five of our Wednesday evenings on these sayings in the summer and autumn of 2024? Well, consider the growing similarities in context. That is, the increasing parallels between the world in which Paul was writing and the one in which we find ourselves today. Of course, there are significant differences between the situations. That was a pre-Christian society, and we are living in a post-Christian society. But this means that the similarity is, then, that both cultural climates are essentially non-Christian. The pace of change of our country from a Christian nation to a post-Christian nation is only accelerating year on year, month on month even. Literacy rates may be much higher in 21st century UK than 1st century Asia Minor, but I wouldn't like to vouch that biblical literacy is much better now than it was then. Somewhat surprisingly, then, we have this great point of contact with our first century 
Mediterranean brothers and sisters. We and they are Christian believers who live in a confused and essentially pagan culture, bearing the distinctive pressures that come with living as a small, often abused minority. In this shared context, succinct, memorable statements of faith reveal themselves to be especially valuable. Valuable formula for us to preach the gospel to our own souls, as we must constantly do as we swim against the ideological tide of the West. Valuable to have at the front of our minds, on the tip of our tongues, as we are increasingly called to give a reason for the hope that is on public display in every true Christian. We, like our brothers and sisters 20 centuries ago, need to be crystal clear about the specifics of our faith. The Christian faith is founded on precepts, on propositional <coughs> truths, statements of fact that are intelligible, able to be formed into sentences in whatever language, that are clearly and concisely communicable. And under the Holy Spirit's inspiration, Paul delivers to us one simply exquisite sentence in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Let's turn to it together. This is number one of our five faithful sayings. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. And that's a short sentence, just 12 words in the Greek, but this is dynamite. And we'll spend the rest of our time meditating upon this humbling and exalting truth. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Now in preparing for this study, I read a lovely story about a man made painfully aware of his own sin who came to faith in Christ through this very verse. And it comes from the early days of the English Reformation when the Cambridge scholar Thomas Bilney first read the New Testament in Greek. And by the way, when the Puritans wrote the word comfortable, they meant something like what we mean by comforting. So comfortable kind of means comforting. Thomas Bilney wrote, At last I heard speak of Jesus, even then when the New Testament was first set forth by Erasmus, and on the first reading, as I well remember, I chanced upon this sentence of St. Paul, most sweet and comfortable sentence to my soul in 1 Timothy 1. It is a true saying and worthy of all men to be embraced that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief and principal. This one sentence through God's instruction and inward working which I did not then perceive, did so exhilarate my heart, being before wounded with the guilt of my sins, and being almost in despair, that even immediately I seemed unto myself inwardly to feel a marvelous comfort and quietness. The quietness of the desert is what Paul desired after his bruising confrontation with the risen Lord on the Damascus Road. He went deep into the Arabian wilderness for three years. Paul tells us that he did not consult flesh and blood to receive the gospel. For years previous, he had been hunting down poor believers in his misplaced religious zeal. Now imagine during those long months, in that lonely, deserted place, the weight of guilt and shame he must have felt. Those words, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, must have been seared into his memory as he thought through how he'd been behaving as an enemy of the God that he professed to love. How he must have 
cringed at the unwelcome memories of his own mouth and hands persecuting the body of his God, Messiah, in the name of that very same God. Then, quietly, humbly, joyfully, dwelling on that amazing grace that saved a wretch like him. God's grace on awesome display in the crucified and risen Christ who floored him in the dust of the road and then raised him up and gave him a job to do, a lifelong mission to complete. And notice the tense in our saying that Paul uses all these decades later in this letter to Timothy, written towards the end of his life in the 60s. Note the tense. Not, I was the worst of sinners, but I am the worst of sinners. Elsewhere, Paul talks with disarming honesty about his ongoing battles with sin. And this is deeply reassuring for us, isn't it? I certainly find it so. We who bear the scars of battling with sin, we know the cost, the weight of the cross, of living as a new creation in Christ, but still engaged in the often confusing, disorientating war with the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Paul writes in Romans 7 of this perplexing burden of sin in the believer's life. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want to do, but do the very thing I hate. Again, see the tense that he uses here, the present tense. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. The frustration is palpable. The fog of spiritual war is real. But what shines through is his courageous self-awareness. He's not pretending that he stands in his own righteousness. He bravely shuns the false comfort of self-justification. He admirably refuses to let himself off the hook. He bears the weight of seeing himself as God sees him, owning up, taking his condemnable state on the chin, not squirming away into the darkness like insects when a rock is taken off them on a summer's day. No, under the holy gaze of his Lord, he realizes that his only hope is not to fight, but to submit, to completely give up on himself. He owns the label, sinner. To be this brutally honest with yourself takes great bravery, but it's a courage that can only arise when the human heart basks in the reassuring, steady light of the gospel. And because we know so much of Paul's biography, even sordid details like when he was a young Pharisee, proud of his great learning under Gamaliel, educated in the Oxbridge, the Ivy League of his day, helpfully holding the coats of the men who stoned Stephen to death. Because we know Paul's sin, we might be tempted to say, yeah, Paul, you really were pretty bad. But devastatingly, when we read God's Holy Spirit-inspired written word, we hear these words in our own voice. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Look at that sentence now. And I'll give us just a few seconds to read it silently in our own voices, in our own heads. Now we see Paul's genius in inviting us to take radical responsibility for our sins, for our sinfulness. Yes, he humbly presents himself as the prototypical sinner. 
But no other human knows better how sinful you are than yourself. You are the only human witness to your countless sinful thoughts over the years. As far as each of us know, individually, we are the chief of sinners. I am the foremost of sinners. And there's no glory in that ugly accolade. But Paul knows that we can only take this fearless moral inventory of our own souls, of our own behavior, in the context of our icy hearts being defrosted by the warmth of the gospel. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Our text, in its form, invites us to memorize these words, to own them. Yes, to own our sinfulness, but also to own the salvation that comes from being in Christ, the Savior of the world, and in him forever. Even if you've not got a great memory, this is perfect for you then, isn't it? It's so short. It's a gift worth grasping hold of and deeply internalizing. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But as we look at the following verse, we see that the amazing grace of God in saving even the worst of sinners from rightly deserved eternal punishment is not actually an end in itself. Verse 16. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect, his perfect what? His perfect grace would make sense. Maybe his perfect love. These we might expect. Jesus Christ shows his mercy to sinners, to Paul specifically here, to display his perfect grace and love. Isn't that right? Well, yes, but in this text, we don't read grace or love. I receive mercy that in me, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience. And although this might seem a strange emphasis, and it is often overlooked, it really is a central theme to all of Paul's teaching. And even the great apostle Peter recognizes Paul's peculiar focus on teaching the patience of Christ. Writing in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, instructions to the church to take the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as our beloved brother also wrote to you, as he does in all his letters. Now, at the moment we are converted, we may well be overwhelmed by God's love, by God's mercy, by God's grace. But if we've lived as a child of God for a, a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, more, we'll be compelled to grow in, a, in an appreciation of God's patience with us. God bears with us. God perseveres with us. <laughs> and he puts up with a lot. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And only you know how much God has put up with you. Only I know just how patient and the specific ways in which God has been patient with me. So foolish, so rebellious, so proud, so cold, so slow to learn, so forgetful of his grace. And I'm sure this is at least one of the reasons why when that woman was brought before Christ who was caught in adultery, remember that. Those people were so full 
of self-righteous indignation. And Jesus said, let him who has no sin cast the first stone. And who went away first? Starting with the oldest. The older we are, the more years we've sinned for. But the more divine patience we have to praise God for receiving. We're here in a training camp tonight, a cohort of students together in the school of Christ. If our assignment is to be more gracious and patient in our lives, and this is something that I certainly desire to grow in, then we must prioritize meditating on just how gracious and patient God has been and is being right now with me, with us. More time profitably used in confessing and repenting of our own sins and less time wasted on counting the sins of others. When I ask parents how I can pray for them, I wonder if you can guess the most common request. More often than not, the answer includes, please pray for more patience for me. Even Christian mums and dads can lose their temper with naughty children. And of course, often there's righteous anger there and a desire to discipline them. But sometimes mixed with selfish, even sinful emotions and desires. But where we fail, our Heavenly Father succeeds. He displays perfect patience with us, his wayward children. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit share this lovely attribute of our triune God and Father. But I s receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Notice what we just read. Jesus displayed his patience in Paul as an example to you. Paul was saved and preserved for you and me. What a thing to realize. Then this wonderful truth leads Paul into another formulaic statement at the end of this section, verse 17. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And this is so Paul, isn't it? And he's so likable in this. And I, I just love the way that he, he bursts out with praise. And so often you can hear him articulate a gospel truth and then interrupt his own thoughts with a spontaneous eruption of worship. It's a real thrill to hear Paul's cup overflow in real time. This saved sinner and his profound amazement and gratitude at just how merciful and patient Jesus Christ has been and still is being towards him explodes into praise. As R.C. Sproul used to say, all theology must lead to doxology. Our beloved Savior gave us every pledge that love could give. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. If that doesn't break our hearts afresh and make them whole again, and then propel us with Paul in wonder, love, and praise, then I don't know what possibly could. I can't imagine a truth more joyful to study than this trustworthy saying. To take this, to truly take this on our own lips, is profoundly humbling. I am the worst of sinners, but also profoundly exalting. Christ Jesus came into the world to save. We are that loved. God's only beloved son came down from perfect bliss and holiness and glory 
to die on that shameful, scandalous, bloody cross to save you. Believing this is surely the most exalting and ennobling and liberating truth to know about yourself. Even though this word this verse does lead us into deep introspection. It is extroverted in its orientation. The focus is not on you. What a relief. Jesus Christ is the object of this sentence. And his objective work is the focus of our faith. And the more vociferous our refusal to take any glory for our own. To point all the attention away from ourselves to the God who has blessed us so lavishly. The more we do this, the more peace and calmness and joy we will experience. And the more God is glorified in our generation. We must give our own unique personal testimony to the power of Christ's salvation in us as an example to others of his perfect patience. The objective facts of the first phrase in our sentence, the objective facts of the first phrase must be met with the subjective apprehension of that salvation. In the second phrase, phrase one, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Objective, phrase two, of whom I am the foremost. Subjective, as the saying goes, many will miss heaven by 18 inches, the distance between their head and their heart. So what have we learned? Well, if you feel yourself getting wound up by EasyJet inexplicably pushing back flight times, then think about all of this. Thank God for travel delays. Who knows, you might end up using even the mundane, frustrating providences in your life to achieve great things in the world. And when we feel the growing sense of frustration with modern life, with all its complex demands, let's use this first faithful saying to constantly remind ourselves that the patience that we're called to exercise with one another is rooted in the immensely deep and rich soil of God's perpetual patience towards you and me. The patience Paul has taught us that is on display in the fact that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Remember Thomas Bilney from earlier? Our hearts were warmed, weren't they, by the joy and comfort the Holy Spirit inspired in him when he first studied those 12 Greek words behind Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. He also commented that the comfort of those words made my bruised bones leap for joy. Isn't that a delightful testimony? The gospel of God's grace in Christ made a man's bruised bones leap for joy. That comfort and joy sustained Thomas to preach the gospel boldly in and around London. But eventually, Roman Catholic opposition resulted in Bilney being physically dragged from the pulpit mid-sermon as he preached over in Ipswich and then imprisoned in the Tower of London. And on the 19th of August, 1531, at Lollard's Pit in Norwich, Thomas was burnt alive for his Protestant faith. Before he went to the stake, he confessed his adherence to the doctrines of grace, which Luther held. And when at it, he smiled and said, 
I have had many storms in this world, but now my vessel will soon be on the shore of heaven. He stood unmoved in the flames, crying out his final testimony, Jesus, I believe. The living word that inspired such patient endurance is ours today. So let's resolve together now to carry its mighty power home with us and let it do its work in our hearts and in our lives. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Praise God. Amen.